Hello, everyone. This is Marissa Swayze, Vice President of Public Relations and Marketing at Quanterix. We'd like to thank you all for joining. And lastly, we'd like to mention and give thanks to our webinar sponsor and also our collaborator, Sino Biological. Quanterix has been working closely with Sino Bio on SARS-CoV-2 related projects, and we have used Sino SARS-CoV-2 antibodies on our Samoa platform. We've obtained promising results. Some of Sino's antigens and antibodies have also been used to manufacture FDA approved COVID tests. We thank Sino for their partnership. And with that, I will turn it over to Kevin Rusofsky. Thank you very much, Marissa. I too would like to thank Sino. Really exciting to get to know them very well. And they are going to become, I think, a really important collaborator with us as we continue to build out our menu over the over the following few years. There's a lot of important opportunities, we think, to work with Sino. So I'm real excited today to talk about the innate immune system. Um, this is not a Pyrene Precision Health Summit webinar. I'm really excited to, to be doing this cooperation with all of the people that, meant, that uh, was mentioned by Marissa. We're gonna start off by me just providing a high level overview of our company and the things that we're working on, primarily in the immune system area, uh, both the innate immune and adaptive immune. But also we're doing some work in COVID um, in the antigen landscape that's pretty exciting. And we continue to monitor NFL, which has now found its way into COVID with people losing taste and smell, um, having uh, some neuronal death measured by our NFL, which has been pretty interesting and important. Dan Sikama will follow me up with a discussion around the dysregulation and our ability to survey and see early on um, cytokine storm and be able to actually predict it. And then finally, our real um, key note speaker today is Dara Duffy um, from Institute Pasteur, who's gonna be talking specifically around the interferon alpha uh, activity and, and some of the um, exasperated inflammatory responses that we're seeing to uh, COVID-19 in COVID-19 patients. And that dysregulation is triggering in some ways cytokine storm. And he's gonna describe how measuring interferon alpha can play a key role in that overall interrogation and surveillance of the cytokine in the innate immune system. To start off, we've got this exquisitely sensitive technology in Quanterix, which allows us to be able to see a thousand times greater the sensitivity and that sensitivity can be deployed in a lot of ways not just looking for low abundant um, biomarkers and proteins it can also be deployed to dilute samples to improve specificity it can also be used to go after home care sampling where you may be just looking at a dry blood spot we also have been able to show a lot of quantitation um, at very low levels of um, you know quantitation we can see the entire range and we also can multiplex and not lose a lot of sensitivity because we have so much sensitivity in the headroom. We did make an announcement three weeks ago that we've now found a way to go another 100X with our technology, this single molecule technology, which would allow us to be almost 100,000 times greater sensitivity than other technologies, which again can be deployed in these other ways um, that we mentioned, dilution being a really important one. On the right-hand side, the ability to transition healthcare from seeing disease late and taking a lot of invasiveness through surgeries and, and serenal spinal taps into early and non-invasive through dry blood spots or through saliva or even venous draws, being able to see exquisite levels of these proteins that uh, translate into a lot of correlative ability to this, um, to dis disintegrate and um, discriminate various clinical disease pathologies. This, um, this next slide basically is just showing the instruments that we sell. The HDX is the one that we've just recently rolled out about three quarters ago. It's, it's a very fast growing. A lot of the serology assays that we're rolling out um, on the, into the market is gonna be done on the HDX. We can run about a thousand samples a day. Uh, the SRX is also selling very rapidly using the same bead-based technology as the HDX. It's just that it's an instrument that only does the, the detection, doesn't do the sample preparation like the HDX, which is fully automated. And now we've got the planer, which is really finding its way in this landscape of cytokines where we can run 10 plexes 
We call it Corplex on the cytokines and even run some chemokines. Very good economics, very good sensitivity, and it's very high throughput. And we think someday it's going to evolve across into home monitoring and helping us run large panels um, from dry blood spots to allow us to see biomarkers long before disease um, start, the pathology of disease starts to transcend the individual. So we think it's a, a big breakthrough opportunity. We sell the assays as well. And we have our own services like a CRO where we've already run nearly 200 uh, trials, uh, phase one, two, three drug trials and do a lot of studies for customers in our accelerator group. It's a great way to get started with us as well as later on running major studies. One of the key things we've done in the last four years is we've allowed the ability to recruit patients and cohorts earlier in the disease cascade, many times even before symptoms, to allow the drug to have greater efficacy and really treating the disease when it's very early stage. And doing it with lower dose has also lower toxicity. The net effect of that is increased the probability of a phase three success after a phase one success by 300%. And you can see that um, we've actually got 51 instruments now in CROs, and we continue to evolve um, that CRO positioning and feel it's going to be an important part. And again, we have our own CRO too and continue to run um, drug trials for customers. We just want to show on this slide that the publications behind the scenes validating our technology, we're now almost to a thousand third party peer reviewed publications, and the number of biomarkers is over 300 now that we can run. 80 of them are off the shelf, and then there's a lot of homebrew that gets run. And economically, our company continues to grow very rapidly. Um, it's very consistent, rapid growth, which is somewhat of the hallmark that we've been able to create. And it's across all components, whether it be our services, our instrument placements, or the consumables, which now are nearly 50% of our revenue. Uh, this is an important um, growth opportunity for the world because each one of these instruments that we deploy are working on very important um, um, you know, advances in various disease pathology. And you can see on this slide, we have customers now from the research institutions through biopharma companies, the major ones, uh, 24 of the top 25, as well as CROs. This is a very significant penetration in just three or four years. And we didn't even have any revenue four or five years ago. So this is a very rapid growth uh, because we're transcending and changing the way drugs are getting developed with this um, technology. During this COVID period, we said we would keep focusing on neurology where we just launched last week. I think it was nearly 700 people attended one of our PPH seminars on launching P, uh, P tau phosphorylated tau 181, which has specificity for Alzheimer's and can differentiate away from uh, uh, frontal temporal dementia and other types of dementia it can give you the specificity in blood. And this is a breakthrough that um, we already are pretty sold out on that particular assay, which we'll start shipping at the end of July. So in addition to that though, we really wanted to bring a lot of focus to COVID, our accelerator in China. And so um, on the COVID front, you can see on this slide that many of the technologies can only see the tops of the peaks of the innate immune system, as well as the adaptive immune serology and even the antigen the time that they can see it is really dictated by their sensitivity. With our technology, we actually can see most of these curves because of the single molecule sensitivity, which does allow us to quantitate, allows us also to do home care through finger prick. And, and in addition, we think it's important to see these antibodies or the antigen earlier, long before potentially even symptoms. And many times in COVID, many patients don't even present with symptoms. And so seeing um, these, these different biomarkers early, we think is very important. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the left-hand side, the innate immune system today, the cytokine storm, which um, we're able to see with our exquisite sensitivity and many of the researchers around the world are deploying it. And we're trying to roll up the information on all of the immune responses, as well as the antigen, which we've just begun to see in blood. We've got a new assay that we're working on. We would hope in the next several months, we will be rolling this out. We would like to see it in saliva as well. So we're working on getting some samples in now to see the antigen like our HIV P24, which was a thousand times more sensitive. 
we'd like to be able to see someday um, the antigen in saliva to make it a much easier test to deploy and to have a lot better um, sensitivity with the specificity. And then the adaptive immune um, system, the serology, we are um, rolling those technologies out um, by the end of this month, actually. So we're pretty excited about being able to see IgG and quantitate it. We have researchers around the world that are supporting us with sample sets in all of the hot zones. And some of these collaborations are shown on this slide. We're very proud to have such amazing um, researchers collaborating with us. And many of the new technologies that we're deploying, we will um, test bed them out into these partners. And right now, I know Henrik Zetterberg, who just spoke last week um, with um, uh, Kai Blinlau on the, uh, the PTAL 181, he'll be running some of the serology and his um, um, HDX over in Sweden. And we're doing the same with Charlotte over in the Netherlands doing the same with LabCorp out on the West Coast to begin seeing from a research basis, RUO basis, exactly all of the capability that the serology assay has. And then we will roll that out broadly, we hope by the end of this month uh, to anyone that has an HDX. So now moving into cytokine, we're very excited today to have Dare Duffy and both Dan Sikama describing in more detail what we're able to do here. But I just wanted on this slide to show you their HDX and the SPX. And you can see the panels that we um, can provide today. And then there's a lot of homebrew as well. But seeing this interferon alpha, the first spike earlier, is key. And we're actually now working on eight different subtypes of interferon alpha because of our sensitivity that further will stratify what this interferon alpha signal means. And so we would like to think in the next, maybe by fourth quarter, we'd be in a position that we could start to roll this out. It's a collaboration we have with Servier. And in this case today, the interferon alpha could be low early and trigger IL-6 and also TNF alpha spikes, which then later on the interferon alpha catches up to and spikes up. And so there's some interesting signatures that lead to the pro-inflammation that you're gonna hear about um, in today's talks. I wanted to show this too, because even in neurology, there's a lot of key inflammation markers. And this was a, a, a study that was just issued last week, showing how uh, capable our technology is versus MSD and, and um, Luminex. And I think you, know, you can see that our, um, the key here is our limit of quantitation is so low that 100% of the data points for all these key markers for in this case, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. There's some neuro uh, neuronal inflammation uh, through cytokines that we can measure. 100% um, of the measurements are above our lower limit of quantitation. And that allows um, this, the full spectrum from healthy to disease to be seen. And this is a very good paper, if you haven't seen it, to further augment and showcase what we have. And in the area of serology, you can see in this slide that there are lysis out there today, but the ability to quantitate and get answers from one microliters and from dry blood spots and see them really early and then see the full spectrum signature of all three isotypes across four different antigens. These are the types of capabilities that we're trying to bring into serology over the next several months in a research basis. And we will consider an EAU as well with the FDA for a patient samples and, and results. But at this point, we're going to try to roll out the RUO by the end of this uh, month of June. And I did want to also continue to point out that NFL plays a role even in COVID with us seeing those that have lost taste and smell having neuronal death and being able to see the spikes of NFL in blood has been another key assay that's been being deployed. And we also know NFL now seeing its way into almost every neuronal uh, degenerative disease as well as concussion and these number of publications now is growing at uh, almost um, exponentially and several drugs in the area of ms have now been approved utilizing our nfl as a secondary surrogate endpoint versus the gold standard mri and it's a much lower cost much faster to see the um, evidence of the disease and blood with the technology and we are running two different um, trials. One's an analytical validity where we, in 17 different sites around the world, we got great CVs across all those sites. And then on the right, clinical validity, looking at what is the NFL level when you're healthy and then 
we have a, a, a large population study that's going to establish that line, and then that will help us for showing um, MS and other diseases that go above the line. And so with that, Dan, I'd like to turn it over to you to start uh, a deeper dive into the area of our innate immune system surveillance. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk today um, a little bit about traditional um, vaccine approaches and how Samoa can kind of get us to the next level. So this first slide I'm showing here really describes uh, how we've done historically with vaccines. We've done a really great job with the development of prophylactic vaccines. We have many vaccines for childhood as well as elderly diseases. And I think the whole COVID situation has really driven a lot of innovation into the vaccine world with all of these different approaches that all of these different companies, nearly 100 different companies working on uh, vaccines and about eight or 10 of them already in clinical trials, some phase twos and phase threes even starting um, within the next month. And I wanna draw your attention to here that um, therapeutically to treat an existing disease is, is a much different approach. There are so many different viruses that can cause cancer. Um, we now have checkpoint inhibitors. We see a lot of uh, development ongoing with the use of these checkpoint inhibitors with appropriate uh, antigens to try to get rid of things like herpes or hepatitis B or hepatitis C, human papillomavirus, something that someone already has. Um, they're beyond the point of prevention. Next slide, please. The uh, history of vaccines in the United States, you can see they've been tremendously successful on a, on a per dollar spent basis. There's never been a more successful uh, medical modality in, in the history of the world. Um, and we're sort of embarking on a new uh, frontier now with, with COVID where we're not just going after a particular age group or a particular geography. We're essentially needing to develop a vaccine that can be deployed uh, worldwide. So the numbers are going to be even larger. And as I was talking to on the previous slide, looking at oncology vaccines and trying to have therapeutic vaccines that cure something that already exists, um, you know, again, the, the scale of that is gonna be so much uh, different than anything we've ever in, encountered before. And if we can get immuno-oncology and oncology and, and these cancer vaccines to the level of success that we've enjoyed with vaccines, just think of how, uh, how great the, the world will be. When you look at uh, vaccine biomarkers, Historically, people are looking at toxin neutralization for diphtheria and tetanus, and viral neutralization is really the key for something like COVID-19, and there are many examples of viral neutralization assays that exist today, and these are cell-based assays, and in the case of COVID-19, I run in a BSL-3 laboratory, not really scalable. So our goal at uh, Quanterix is to develop serologic assays based on immunoglobulin G or even subpopulations of the IgG and A and M that are especially uh, effective at neutralizing um, viral infections and correlating them to those cellular diseases so that we have a broadly deployable uh, assay that can be deployed globally and worldwide rather than only in highly specialized, very small laboratories with very low um, throughput. So examples of immunogenicity that have been used for correlates of protection, um, you'll see on this slide, these are historical data from World Health Organization and other organizations. Typically, you derive a particular antibody level or a particular functional antibody level that correlates with protecting a population from disease. This is still to be determined for COVID-19. Um, the viral neutralization, as I said, is considered the gold standard, but you can see that many of these other diseases above um, have evolved to a immunoassay, an enzyme immunoassay in ELISA, where they may have actually started out as a toxin neutralization assay or a viral neutralization assay. So it certainly is possible. Uh, it depends on the size of the trials and the duration of the trials, but these are all the types of things that we're trying to accomplish with the uh, Quanterix technology. So why do people measure antibodies? You'll hear that that's been in the news a lot lately. It's been all over the news. How do we determine whether a person is immune and whether that immunogenicity is durable? Uh, people measure antibodies for a variety of reasons historically, and a natural infection may be very different than a vaccination. Um, the natural infection is going to have antibodies against a wider variety of proteins within the virus and not just specifically those that are to the vaccine antigens. So those will be some fundamental differences. So uh, when people are enrolling their clinical trials for these vaccine studies, they're going to want to know if a person has had a prior exposure. Again, having a highly sensitive assay to determine whether a person has been previously exposed and has uh, already prepared or, or uh, antibodies against the virus. 
And we're going to want to also know how long those antibodies last, what's the durability of them. Um, there may be studies where in the elderly that they're giving the vaccine, I'll talk about that on the next slide, where they're giving flu vaccines and other vaccines at the same time. And then ultimately correlating those serum antibodies to what we call a correlate of protection. And I'm going to talk for a moment also about antibody maturity, avidity maturity, and memory, and why those are important in the vaccine world. So when you look at childhood vaccines, you can see that there's a variety of different schedules. Different countries of the world use different vaccines from different manufacturers. They give them at a different time schedule, so it gets very complicated very quickly. And then in the case of adolescents, now we have vaccines against meningococcal disease, and we have vaccines against human papillomavirus. And in the elderly, as I mentioned, they may want to only go to the doctor once and get their shot for shingles or their pneumonia shot or their flu shot. So people that are doing these vaccine studies are going to have to uh, take all of these different types of things into account. It may be a standalone vaccine initially. Again, we don't know. It's too early in the process of developing the vaccines, um, but ultimately they would like to uh, administer these vaccines as combinations rather than uh, coming back individually for separate uh, uh, shots. And it's not just how much antibody a person makes. What's the isotype? So Kevin talked about IgG, IgA, and IgM against four different antigens. We also know that uh, with the COVID uh, infection initially, people make an IgG3 response. That's fairly unique. That's not very common in a lot of different uh, uh, bacterial and viral pathogens. And over time, so people make antibodies those, that first week of exposure, the antibodies change in the second week and third week and fourth week post-exposure, so the antibodies mature. And functional antibodies can take even longer to develop. They can take three or four weeks to develop, or they might require several different shots. Um, so two different immunizations a month apart. How well do those antibodies persist? We measure them right after four weeks after immunization, but what about three months later, six months later, 12 months later? All of these things are being accounted for in vaccine clinical trials going forward. Um, is there memory? If you give them a, a, another shot a year later, does it jump up very quickly or does it act as if it's a primary exposure and you're starting all over from scratch again with your immune system and it's gonna take three or four weeks? And is memory fast enough? We know that the COVID infection, people say the incubation period is roughly uh, two weeks. Um, so if you can mount an immune response and memory responses typically take three to five to seven days, that's great. The example that I have here about Haemophilus B meningitis, um, from colonization in the throat to a very tragic, uh, or per perhaps even as severe as, as death to the child can occur in as short as 24 to 48 hours. So that's why we give childhood vaccines at two, four, and six months of age and another shot in the second year of life. We have to keep the threshold of the antibody levels high enough for that first two years of life while their immune system is maturing so that they don't get these really rapid onset um, meningitis type of organisms. I think we're good. It remains to be determined, but I think we're good with something like COVID to have a memory response. So even though antibody titers will go down over time, um, if a memory response is robust and sufficient, um, that should protect people against subsequent challenges from the real virus. And this is just a slide I took from New England Journal of Medicine many years ago, um, showing that a lot of different viruses and a lot of different natural exposure to viruses gives a very long-term, uh, lifelong immunity. Whereas you see on the lower right-hand side, tetanus and diphtheria, that's a shot that everybody is recommended to receive every 10 years. And that's because the immunogenicity to those recombinant antigens, those purified antigens, um, is not as durable as necessarily a natural infection with some of these viruses or a live virus um, vaccine. And as we're mo moving forward with the Quanterix technology, it's also very important that we work with regulators. And we're doing this routinely, working with FDA, Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, all of these different types of organizations to engage them in this technology, educate them about the technology, differentiate technology from historical uh, means. And we've been actually invited to the FDA several times and I was astounded because the comment was, this is wonderful. Can you, can you educate us on this? We always feel like we're behind in technology and people are submitting data to us on technologies that we're not familiar with. And they've actually created entire educational programs within the FDA to bring in outside vendors to educate them on 
new types of technologies and their benefits. So that was actually uh, very rewarding. I'm going to talk for a moment here, um, the use of a mycobacterial stimulant in a pancreatic cancer study. I didn't know what this was initially. I was looking at uh, interferon gamma in patients that are treated with a standard of care for pancreatic cancer. And they used a what they called a nonspecific immunostimulant, and they called it IMM-101. When I looked it up, I found out that it's essentially um, proteins from a bacteria very similar to tuberculosis. And you'll see on my very last bullet point here that the BCG vaccine may actually influence healthy innate immune responses. And we've worked with a collaborator at Harvard and she's published on this extensively over the past decade um, using the BCG vaccine uh, to actually reverse or modulate diabetes type one. And we've actually found out because of all of these COVID studies that countries that still routinely use the BCG like South Korea and Japan had perhaps 50% less deaths than they had in uh, other countries that do not use it. So there may actually be benefit to using BCG, even though it's not directly a COVID vaccine, but it may have um, safety effects or protective effects or uh, actually help the immune system, the innate immune system, which Dara is going to talk about in a few moments um, specifically. A uh, couple slides very quickly here, HIV. These are using latency reversal agents where uh, the virus is hiding so successfully in people they can't detect it anymore by PCR. A new class of drugs called latency reversal agents chases the virus back out. And they felt it was very important to use our technology to measure uh, virion expression by protein synthesis and not PCR to actually measure de novo uh, virus uh, coming back. And a little tip to Sinobiologics here, we used their antibody pair from a, a typical ELISA, had a sensitivity for detecting the COVID uh, nucleocapsid protein uh, at about 48 picograms per ml. Simply using those excellent antibodies on our technology actually improved the sensitivity to 15 femtograms per ml, essentially a 3,000 fold um, improvement in sensitivity. And going forward here also, we did the same thing with the dengue viral program. And dengue virus is a very uh, unique virus in that second infections are much more severe than first infections. So having a highly sensitive IgM assay, in this case, 10,000 times more sensitive than uh, diagnostic kits, was actually very beneficial for identifying um, primary infections with uh, the dengue virus versus secondary infections. And the same thing for Clostridium difficile. The nucleic acid test actually tells you whether the bacteria is present, but the bacteria is not what hurts the patient. It's actually the Clostridium difficile toxin, which is expressed and secreted from the bacteria. So it's separate from the bacteria. So a person could theoretically have the bacteria, but not be expressing the toxin. So again, just like botulism toxin and other types of toxins, these are present at incredibly low rates and require a very, very sensitive assay to measure them. And traditionally they're measured in stool, being able to measure them in blood is much more uh, of, a, of a simple approach and actually determines if they have a biologically relevant level of the concentration of that toxin. And I just also wanna note on my sort of getting to my last slide or two here, that we're not limited to just antibodies and antigen proteins. We can actually use nucleic acid probes as capture molecules within the technology to detect nucleic acid at the single molecule level. And we're measuring directly what is there at the nucleic acid level and that was amplified. So we don't have the problems with contamination during amplification. So we are seeing some collaborators use our technologies in ways that we hadn't really thought of initially, um, but using them very successfully and getting PCR level sensitivity at the nucleic acid um, without having to use any amplification. A wide variety of samples that have been used. So people come to us with all different kinds of uh, issues and we like to solve their problems. As we said, we have a, a CLIA certified laboratory. We do a lot of assay development, custom applications for those clients. So they come to us and, uh, with an existing assay or a need for an assay and we work with them to develop um, the most sensitive, best assay for their particular um, application. Cardiology, you'll see on the right-hand side, some of those same cytokines that are involved in the cytokine storm with COVID. 
Um, so there's been a lot of evolution in cardiac monitoring of people. And again, as Kevin said, being able to find things before they're symptomatic. You don't want to wait until you're shoveling your driveway in February. You want to know if you have ongoing cardiac disease and get treatment. Um, so asymp asymptomatic detection of disease is, is preferable to symptomatic detection. I think my last slide here talks about parallelism. And again, Biogen tested nine different assay technologies and looked at them for these four cytokines. And you can't really do parallelism if you can only get one dilution to be able to measure your sample and everything else is below the limit of quantitation. As Kevin said, having extra headroom on that sensitivity allows us to do additional dilutional linearity studies and determine the parallelism of our unknown samples relative to our calibrators. And this has been a big issue with the FDA over the past several years in Crystal City meetings where people want to uh, implement parallelism studies um, for biomarkers, and the main reason being that biomarkers typically use a recombinant calibrator, but you're measuring native proteins, and dilutability is a key parameter in establishing parallelism, and we've been able to do that very successfully. So this is my last slide, and I'll turn things over, but Samoa is really here to help enable clinical validation, moving those research programs and development programs into clinical validation, and helping develop new biomarkers um, with greater sensitivity um, for disease uh, management going forward. Thanks very much. So we'd now like to invite Dara. Hi. So thanks, uh, Kevin, Dan, Marissa, and Elizabeth, for the invitation to present some of our COVID research, uh, ongoing work at the Institute Pasteur, where I lead a translational immunology lab. And, re and really, our, our primary research interest is to understand variability in immune responses. Why are two people, any two people, uh, have different immune responses and have different responses to infection? So that's really the, the fundamental basis of many of our projects. And when the COVID-19 pandemic arrived, it seemed really pertinent in terms of the, the strategies we apply to understand variability in, in immunity, in particular to infection. Um, if you think about infection with SARS-CoV-2, um, there's different outcomes. Um, there's a high percentage of asymptomatic people, so people whose immune response can clear the infection without showing any uh, major symptoms. And there was this nice uh, meta-analysis from, from Eric Topol's group at the Scripps uh, recently where they looked at a lot of these big cohort studies all around the world and really saw consistent um, high levels of asymptomatic infection between 30 and 45 percent. And they looked at some of the reasons for this, and this is still um, ongoing work, so it's it's um, hypotheses rather than shown, but really some of the, the prominent ideas for protection and asymptomatic infection are, are either the presence of cross-reactive coronavirus antibodies, so or a cellular immunity against some of the other coronaviruses that are out there. It could be uh, due, due to differences in expression of the cellular receptor for the virus, so mainly ACE, but there could be other players implicated in that that are coming out in, in all of the ongoing studies that have been published uh, every, every few days now. The genetics is starting to give some, some interesting uh, results. There's this intriguing association with non-type A blood that's come out in a few studies, so it still needs to be confirmed that it's not due to any uh, underlying compounding factors. And one GWAS study that has reported some variability in TLR3, or sorry, in, in chromosome 3, um, that appears to be potentially associated with the, the receptor for the virus. But that's in terms of asymptomatic infection, what, what's, what's different in individuals that um, don't succumb to severe infection. But of course, more people do display symptoms, um, but still the, the majority of people that do display symptoms manage to control it and have a mild or moderate infection where the estimate numbers still at a range between 45 and 65 percent of people infected with the virus. They could have symptoms that are, are equivalent to a severe flu with you, you know days, weeks, even, even months of unpleasant symptoms, but they don't require critical uh, medical help. Unfortunately, for those people that do, and, and here the estimate is between 5 and 10 percent of infection cases that go on to uh, be classified as severe or critical, this seems to occur in a, in a two-wave pa um, passive. There's initial presentation of symptoms that are mild to moderate, and then in a second wave, there's a severe worsening of, of clinical symptoms uh, really in the, in the respiratory tract between 9 and 12 days later 
uh, and and this leads through into into the high debt rate of uh, 0.5 to one percent. And some of the the strong fact risk factors for severity, this is pretty consistent and and well understood now is really old age, male sex, and high BMI. But we still don't really know how those factors are impacting uh, an individual's ability to moderate the virus or to to go on to develop symptoms. So as immunologists, we want, really wanted to look at, well, what's different in the, in the immune responses of, of these individuals that may lead to these different patterns? And some of the objectives we had with this approach was, can we identify biomarkers to stratify patients based on their immune response? Can we identify the key immune pathways that are required for uh, protection to the virus to, to give us clues for new therapies? And, and we just heard a lot about vaccines. Can we identify correlates of protection to guide the vaccine design and eventually uh, vaccine deployment, because we still don't really have good correlates of protection uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So to ask some of these questions, we established a, a study at Hapadel Cochon, so with in collaboration with many different people. Uh, some of the, the key people here are listed here, from Hapadel Cochon, from Pasteur and APHP in Paris, and Imagine Institute. Um, and this was back in, in March, the, the last two weeks of March, really at the, the beginning of the peak of, of the pandemic in France, where we managed to recruit 50 COVID patients with a mean age of 55. Uh, there was a, a sex bias towards um, men and, and they were harmonized over days eight to 12 post symptoms because that seems to be the, really the key moment for, for the, the development of severity or critical uh, disease. So all of the patients were in that eight to 12 post days post symptoms period. So we just this, this is the nasal swab viral load within these individuals, just to make the point that the, the, the differences in their outcome wasn't due to differences in, um, in viral load. So really it's the ideal setup for studying what is different in the immune responses between these different categories of patients. So in its first study, we looked at um, the, the immune responses in the blood, different technologies. So CYTOF, which is a cyt mass cytometry-based approach where you can analyze circulating immune cells in the blood. We did gene expression by nanostrings. So this is a gene, uh, a hybridization array approach where we quantified up to 600 key immune genes. And then for cytokines, we use both Samoa and Luminex. So we've been using Samoa for a number of years. Um, and in this study, we used our own homebrew triplex where we measure interferon alpha-2, interferon gamma, and IL-17. We also used a quanteric triplex of IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-10, and then a homebrew singleplex for interferon beta, uh, one of the other um, type one major type 1 interferon responses. So in the past, we've been measuring all of the subtypes of interferon alpha with a pan-interferon alpha antibody. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have the right to use those antibodies anymore, but we've been using this interferon alpha-2 specific assay, which correlates uh, pretty well in the vast majority of patients with the, the pan-alpha responses. In parallel, we ran a Luminex, so this is a 40-plex, 45-plex uh, high-performance assay from R&D. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these different technologies, what we've learned from them, and the color code for the patients is, is really all the same. And it goes from left to right in terms of healthy controls, moderate, severe, and, and critical. So the first, uh, what I'm going to show you is the, the CYTOF data. So it's been reported in, uh, in, in severe COVID disease, there is lymphopenia in the blood. This is confirmed here by the clinical assays. So the idea with the CYTOF was to go for a more unbiased approach and see if we could drill down into uh, the subpopulations of immune cells and see what is different. So here with CYTOF, we measured over 30 parameters, and this is a TISNI plot, so a dimension reductionality approach, where you can capture all of that data in two dimensions as plotted on this TISNI map, and then color code for the different immune cell subtypes. So if you look at the TISNI map for healthy control, the moderate and the sphere and the critical, you can start to see some differences, namely down here. So this large presence of uh, the gray, this is uh, differences in monocytes, and up here you can see differences uh, which are T cells, but we can obviously drill down and look at those individual plots and numbers of the cells. And here you can see a decline in CD3 cells, decline in CD8 T cells, but also a decline in NK cells with uh, critical infection. 
in parallel to seeing this decline of, of circulating lymphocytes, we also saw an increase in exhaustion markers and, and apoptotic markers on those cells. So here you're looking at an increase in the expression of PD-1 on the CD4 cells, increase in PD-1 on the activated CD8 cells, and TIM3 on the NK cells. So these are all activation exhaustion markers, So, so um, meaning that th these T cells are, are, are been driven towards exhaustion. Um, we also saw higher levels of an XM5. This is an apoptosis marker, both in CD4 and CD8 T cells, suggesting that these T cells are, are um, undergoing apoptosis. In parallel to the loss of T cells, we also saw an increase in circulating B cells and plasma blasts. So here's the increase in CD19 B cells and an increase in plasma blasts. And this occurs in parallel to the uh, production of antibodies. And, and this is confirmed with uh, an increase in B cell activation and plasma blast differential genes um, that were measured by gene expression. So switching from the, the cellular assays to transcriptomics, I uh, mentioned we, we ran a nanostring. Uh, there are human immunology panel. This is a clustering uh, heat map showing you the differences you can see with increasing disease severity, really an increase in, in many of these immune genes as you move towards critical uh, disease. So we wanted to drill down into this to see what genes could tell us might be driving these differences between these patients. And this is a PCA analysis. You can see in black, these are all the healthy controls and really a difference along principal component one between these healthy controls and the severe and critical with the mild to moderate split across that. So if we look at what's driving that PC1, we did GCA enrichment analysis on the gene sets. And we could see it's really differences in immune responses as expected, increase in innate immune signaling, TLR signaling, MHC1, really all these um, pathways are going up with infection as you might expect. But more interestingly, if we now look at PC2, you can start to see slight segregation of the red, the critical, and the severe and the moderate. So this is really more interesting now if we drill down into what's driving PC2. Here there's less, but we still came out with two pathways, a type 1 interferon signaling and a type 2 interferon signaling. Um, so we wanted to look at this in more detail. And now look, this is a heat map of the ISG genes. Um, so the genes induced by type 1 interferons. And here it started to get a little bit more complicated in that we saw an increase in the critical cases of uh, genes involved in signaling, such as the receptor, if not one, JAK1 and, and TIC2. So these are the molecules just downstream of the, the receptor. However, for some of the key antiviral ISGs, such as MX1, IFIT1, IFIT2, these were downregulated in critical disease. So really it starts to get a bit more nuanced and complicated in what's going on in these interferon signaling pathways. So we want to obviously measure the protein and see, well, are all of the, the patients um, secreting the same levels of interferon alpha protein, the key antiviral cytokine. And, and this is where the, the Samoa assays came in. So we measured interferon alpha protein by Samoa. Here you can see the healthy controls. We have a strong induction in the moderate cases, but really a striking decline as you progress towards uh, critical disease. We also complemented this by measuring interferon activity. So this is a cytopathic assay that measures the fun functional ability of plasma from these patients to inhibit viral infection in ex vivo assay. And this paralleled with the alpha-2 uh, protein expression and also the ISG score. So this is a, a cumulative um, score of six key IS genes, ISG genes uh, in the blood. And interestingly, these ISGs correlated nicely with the interferon alpha protein is measured by Samoa. So really it appears to be a consistent defect in type 1 interferon responses in these critical patients. So this was a single um, time point. So the question now is, well, uh, uh, so before we go into that, um, we also went back to the, the, the cellular data and looked at the plasmacytoid dendritic cells. These are the major circulated immune cells that secrete type 1 interferon. And indeed they were downregulated in uh, critical disease, and th this correlated with the interferon alpha-2 expression. So really, many layers of the type 1 interferon pathway seem to be dysregulated in critical uh, COVID-19 infection. So I mentioned about the timing. So all of these patients were between 8 to 12, initially 8 to 12 days post-symptomatic. We did manage to get some samples that were at a later point. And if, and if we split the different groups, across those days where they're grouped between 8 to 10, 11 to 13, and 14 to 17. We can see in the moderate cases, although the numbers are low, the interferon alpha protein remains high, but with severe and critical cases, it either goes low or, or is low throughout. 
Um, and then in a smaller subset of patients, we managed to get a retrospective sample that was prior to them being admitted to ICU. So this is now graphed into stable. Um, this is prior to the development of critical disease and when those patients were admitted into the ICU. And you can see that um, low type 1 interferon preceded clinical deterioration and actually had a pretty strong odds ratio for association with development of critical risk. So that's in terms of the interferon. And then just the, the last part, um, we know about the cytokine storm uh, in COVID. So we also looked at many of the chemokines and, and cytokines that are associated with that. We could see again, a lot of this large um, red in this heat map in the critical cases is due to an increase in those um, key inflammation markers that's mapped here in terms of the NF kappa B signaling pathway. Um, and then we confirm that at the protein level, sorry, at the cellular level first, an increase in circulating neutrophils, no changes in, in circulating classical monocytes, but a severe downregulation in non-classical monocytes um, in parallel to this increase in uh, inflammation. And then confirming that at the protein level, many groups have shown IL-6 um, using more clinical-based assays. We confirm that with Samoa, where we really get this strong uh, distinction between healthy groups um, where, where IL-6 is really low um, and the moderate and the severe and the critical. And then more interesting, TNF-alpha, that is sometimes more upstream of IL-6, and it's proposed to be targeted with anti-TNF therapies. Here, there was a strong, significant difference, even though the, the, the levels were, were much more lower and subtle. Uh, and here, you know, this is really the power of Samoa that you can only really pull out these differences because of the accuracy you have at this low uh, picogram or even sub picogram per ml. Interestingly, I one beta was no difference. This was measured with the with the Luminex assay. We want to go further with this in Samoa because the receptor antagonist was significantly higher and critical, um, and we still don't fully understand what's going on there because there was no induction of I one beta protein, at least measured by by the Luminex assay. So, in conclusions, what I hope I've, I've convinced you is that there really is impaired type one interferon responses that are associated with increased disease severity in critical cases of, of COVID-19. This is in parallel to increases in inflammatory pathways and kappa B signaling. Uh, and we also identified perturbations in hemostasis and cell death pathways. And th this has given indications uh, for new treatment strategies to, to really target and boost the interferon response while potentially in parallel inhibiting inflammation. And, and these particular results have inspired an ongoing clinical study an interventional one with treatments to, to really address that. We do need to be careful because the timing in these responses is critical. Um, we need longitudinal studies to, to, to address that. Uh, and I mentioned some of the limitations here. It's a single time point for most of the data sets. It's a homogeneous patient population and it's, it's only in blood. So we are addressing that with some ongoing studies, um, working with other collaborators, um, in particular going into the nasal swabs uh, to the infected side, so working with the team of James and Santo, also integrating the antibody responses, uh, working with Olivia Schwartz and Hugo Moke. Um, clearly, antibodies are important, in particular to understand what's good for, for a vaccine response, and extending this beyond um, a homogeneous health uh, so adult population to look in pediatric patients and elderly patients, um, where there's both less and more severe cases of infection. And then going further in these um, perturbed immune responses, looking at the stimulated immune response, working with teams at Trinity College Dublin um, to really see in, in more depth how these uh, type 1 interferon and inflammatory responses are perturbed by stimulating the, the, the response of these patients. So I'm going to stop there with the key last slide of many, many people involved in this. Um, I listed all the, the co-authors on this preprint. It's currently in peer review, so we hope it will be published soon. Um, and also for some of the ongoing work with uh, the, the different teams at Pasteur, and I've highlighted in bold uh, the individuals at Pasteur that are working with me and my team um, uh, to, to enable this study. And of course, the financing from the French ANR, the Institute Pasteur, and, and the LabEx Million Terry Consortium, uh, which I'm co coordinating at Pasteur. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions and, and join in the discussion. Thank you very much, Dara. I, um thought it might be good if you could look through the questions in the chat room because I don't think we're going to get live verbal questions. And while you're looking through those, I will answer a couple that um, I could see that would be more directed towards me. But then I'd turn it over to um, you, 
Dara, for whatever questions you could see that you can answer. I know there was one in there about the specificity of interferon alpha um, and what it can do for, you know, COVID detection, which I think you'll, you can comment on that it's probably better served to monitor after being detected. But um, let me hit a couple of the items first. You know, one, one question that came up is how large is the addressable market in CROs for Quanterics? And it's about 300 million is the size of the market for um, probably the two categories, neur neuronal, um, I call it any anything in the neuro pipeline, as well as um, oncology. The second question that was of interest was, do we have anything going on in South America and also India? And we do have a distributor in India and we're working on South America, but our collaborations are fairly minimal at this time. So we'd love to build those up and further go after that with our Powering Precision Health collaborative um, assessments. And then um, one of the third items on serology, there was a question around, is our IgG, is it neutralizing for COVID? And I think this is a really important point. As we quantitate, we're going to be able to tell you how much antibody IgG is there opposite the, um, in this case, um, we, we are focused on the spike protein in the, in the single plex that we're rolling out first, but then we have multiplex where IgG would go across four different antigens, including uh, nucleocopes uh, pat Placid, as well as um, S1 and um, receptor binding domain. So those are four other antigens that we can measure IgG against. But this question of neutralization, we are teaming up with a CRO that has a great neutralization assay that they've uh, been able to really hone in on um, some convalescent samples and create a lot of correlative um, assessment on their their neutralization assay, it's a cell-based assay. And what we'd like to do is calibrate RIGG versus spike, which we do think is gonna be protective and um, should be neutralizing, but to create a, um, a neutralization uh, correlation so we can calibrate neutralization on the quantitation of our IgG test. So we're pretty excited about that collaboration with a key CRO um, that we can talk more about in the next uh, few weeks as they're running some trials on this um, this advance. So, Dara, I wonder if I could turn over to you to see if you would mind taking a few of the other questions that uh, came up here. Sure, there's a lot of questions coming in, um, so it's great to see the interest. I'll, I'll try and answer as many as I can. So, there's one: How does BMI affect the severity of COVID? Um, I'm not sure we know yet. My best guess is people with you know higher BMI are going to have higher underlying inflammation. And inflammation seems to be key for driving severity. Um, so that's likely to be playing a role there. Another question, have we studied the viral load in serum? So so we have actually, this is in the preprint. I, I didn't have time to show today. Um, so this was a team at the Pompidou Hospital, Helen Pear, who using a digital PCR assay to quantify um, SARS-CoV-2 was able to quantify the virus in the plasma and and Surprisingly, it was present in it in the majority of patients, but um, was more associated with severe disease. So um, we're interested to, to explore that further. Are there any genetic changes between patients in upstream transcriptome factors? Um, so we're not powered for genetics and we didn't have any genetic data in this, but that's a great question um, and may actually be behind some of the, the underlying differences in these interferons. Um, we've touched on the subtypes a bit. There's 14 subtypes, um, interferon alpha subtypes. We're just measuring alpha two with this assay, but they've been shown to, to be pretty diverse at the genetic level. Um, and we still don't really have a good understanding of their differences in terms of their function. Um, so definitely more to do there. So yeah, someone asked about measuring the interferon subtypes. Yeah, that's coming up a couple of times. During longitudinal studies, what would be the typical frequency in cytokine monitoring in severe COVID-19 patients? A few times a day. I'm not sure if you would need it a few times a day. You know, daily will be great already. I think you would you would start to see the severe changes. Um, we heard earlier, you know, you can go two weeks without symptoms. 
mild to moderate at the beginning and and there's really appears to be a key window where something happens between the host and the virus um and that you know it's speculate is maybe between four to to ten days so i think that's really the window to focus in that we really need to to understand what's what's going on and what's different between the patients that are developing severe symptoms and, and i'm sure those studies are, are going on what we're able to find about males been more vulnerable we haven't really been able to study that again the sample size wasn't sufficient and actually when we try and look at some of the sex differences in our cohort um we can't because nearly i think all of the the critical cases were actually males so that doesn't allow us to look at sex differences that might be behind that um so we'll need bigger studies and, and i know it's 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 an active area of of, of research Dara, one one question I see here is how quickly do you see the interferon alpha spike after infection? I was curious what your views might be on that. So again, the earliest we looked was you know day post symptoms. Normally, inter type one interferon comes up really quickly after infection in the first few days. We don't know yet if that's the case because the one of the challenges with COVID and why it's spreading so widely is is the symptoms don't appear often for two weeks. Yep. So, um, you know, getting hold of those samples. Um, SMO is a great approach to be able to address those questions, but but getting that samples, it, we, we need to do retrospective sampling um, of people that were exposed and later turned out to, be, to have infections. So, so we're looking to try and find those cohorts. So but, Darren, one thing we're doing is we're running a population study over 10 weeks and we're running it in areas where there's still new cases coming in. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be monitoring blood dry spots um, across 10,000 people uh, each week for 10 weeks. And so I do think we're going to find some sample sets that will be pre-symptomatic as well as asymptomatic. Um, that should be interesting to then run some of, you know, your interferon alpha on and see kind of what we can learn. Yeah, the, uh, those those powers are going to be really powerful. Um, so it's great that you, you're able to get get some of those studies up and running. Um, you know, the, the pandemic's more or less under control in France, so there, there isn't so many cases anymore, which is great, but, um, you know, that's not the case everywhere in the world. So the focus needs to move to to those areas where, where the, unfortunately, those, those, those cases still are occurring in, in high frequency. I, I apologize. I do think we're out of time, Dara and Dan. I think that, you know, you guys did an incredible job helping see into this area um, of cytokines. And we are, as you know, they're working with Servier to try to further build out the subtypes of interferon alpha so that that can be measured too on Samoa. Yep. And we, can, we cannot thank you enough for the work you're doing. Patients around the world are desperately searching for understanding of the immune system. And I think there'll be a lot of um, immunity fatigue that's gonna occur post there's a lot of surveillance going on um, around what this all might mean, you know, the next couple of years too. So thank you so much for um, sharing this with us today. And we'll be probably trying to get more questions to Dara and, and Dan and then get answers out to everybody that attended. We really want to thank you very much for uh, attending this session. Thank you.